Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we visit communities fighting for solutions in the face of adversity. In the Bronx, New York, a unique film program is training the next more diverse generation of storytellers. Plus, a conversation with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Olympian Allison Felix about the power of wellness. But first, we turn to the increasing challenges of achieving home ownership facing many Americans, particularly those in the LGBTQ community. Lilia Luciana visits an Illinois town developing a reputation for being an affordable safe haven. At 30 years old, Alex Martin owns a home, something she never thought was possible. I get a little bit emotional because I'm like, this is stable. Why is that important? I'm black, I'm trans, and I'm visibly so. And so having a space that like I made that I can just come in and recharge and I'm ready to face the world again. In Peoria, Illinois, and she's not alone. Many LGBTQ and people of color statistically less likely to own homes because of discrimination and wealth gaps are moving here. At first, they came from places like New York and Seattle where home prices are sky high. Now, many are coming from some of the 21 states that have recently passed anti-LGBTQ legislation. They can come and get a $200,000 house here. Realtor Mike Van Cleve sold almost 80 homes, nearly a third of them to out-of-staters chasing a dream that started on TikTok. I'm not a realtor, but I live in super affordable Peoria, Illinois, and I think you should live here too. Not a realtor, Angie Ostrashevsky says she has single-handedly grown Peoria's population by about 360 in three years. When I first started making TikToks about Peoria, it was about improve your quality of life. But in the last six months, people are relocating here more for survival. And that's such a different conversation. Do you hope to have that kind of contagion effect? I love the idea of shaking up that Big cities are the only places that LGBTQ plus people can thrive. Pride in home ownership and building a more inclusive community. From new housing to sacred land, members of the Cherokee Nation are advocating for the fulfillment of a long overlooked promise of representation in Congress. Ed O'Keefe spoke with tribal leaders about their continued efforts fighting for a seat at the table. All that we need to do is for the House to seat me. The Cherokee Nation chose Kimberly Teehee as its first ever delegate to the House of Representatives, and the Native American tribe says it's owed a seat in Washington. That's because of an 1835 treaty the tribe signed with the United States government before one of the darkest moments in their history, when they were forced out of their homes and pushed west. About 4,000 people died along the Trail of Tears, but they emerged with a little known promise. And that promise was very simple. The Cherokee Nation shall have a delegate in the United States House of Representatives when Congress shall make provision for the same. Chuck Hoskin is president of the Cherokee Nation. We lost a quarter of our population, but we had to rebuild and we just had to survive. And it's really only been within the past uh, 40, 50 years that the Cherokee Nation has been allowed by the United States to exercise its right of self-government. Teehee is a former congressional staffer, official for the Democratic National Committee and Obama administration, making her no stranger to Capitol Hill. You know, you worked here. Mm -hmm. Place is broken. You know, but, Why things, but things still get done. And you still have to have faith in a system. You know, we've seen the benefits of what advocacy and educating Congress has done. If it gets its House seat, Cherokee Nation would serve alongside other non-voting members from Puerto Rico, American Samoa, the District of Columbia, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is represented by Democrat Stacey Plaskett. Our function is to operate as much as possible as another member of Congress. We offer legislation, we sponsor legislation, co-sponsor legislation. The defining difference is that on final passage, we do not vote. Plaskett says if another group of people are owed a seat, it's only fair to let them in. A treaty is a contract. The United States government made a contract with the Cherokee Nation. We, I believe, must honor the terms of that agreement. The movement to seat the Cherokee Nation picked up speed when Democrats held the first ever hearing on the issue. The Treaty of New Echota requires, requires, Mr. Chairman, the House to seat our delegate. 
I urge you to seat Kim Teehee without delay. But Republicans, who now control the House, haven't said what they might do. Today's hearing is a good first step, but we have a long way to go in the process. The Cherokee are relying on people like Brian Hale, health care executive on the reservation, to make their case. We do typically about 1.8 million patient care visits per year. Hale explains that the kind of federal health care funding Indian reservations receive can be cut off during government shutdowns, an increasing threat in closely divided Washington. That might make it harder for doctors to schedule procedures. So things like a colonoscopy for screening someone for colon cancer, that's not going to get done when there's a government shutdown. That delegate can help us advocate for mandatory funding. The Cherokee push for its House seat comes amid ongoing campaigns for statehood in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Many Republicans fear that those new seats would be won by Democrats. Chief Hoskins says that's not what this is about. The Cherokee Nation is not seeking statehood because we're a sovereign government. We're a sovereign tribal government. We're uniquely situated uh, in sort of the family of American governments. And Tihi says the family owes her people more of a seat at the table. We're a patient people. We persevere and we'll continue to educate until we finally get this through the finish line. Coming up, a free film program teaching kids to share their unique stories. This is Eye on America. Art can be a powerful tool in bridging different worlds. A free program founded in New York City called Ghetto Film School is giving students of color the skills to tell their own stories. Jeff Glor met some of these rising stars and the instructors giving them lights, camera, and action. First word that comes to mind when you think GFS. Opportunity. New. Community. Caring. Collaboration. I would say storytelling. It's not every day you find a group of students from the Bronx working alongside kids from a Manhattan Jewish day school. The timeline is where we build out our projects. But a two-year-old partnership between the Ghetto Film School and the Ramaz School aims to curb racism and anti-Semitism with an art alliance. Projects from kids like Lila Elman and David Rubin. So you're working on a story where the two main suspects in a murder, one is a black man and the other mm -hmm. is a Jewish man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's loaded. Yes, it's very loaded. What we did was that we invited our history teacher, a black woman, and we had them cook two different dishes together, one black and one Jewish inspired by their cultures. And then we had them mix them together to sort of create the synergy between the two. We should be the ones to tell our stories. The Ghetto Film School, a two and a half year free program funded by wealthy donors and championed by celebrities, was formed back in 2000 by Joe Hall. The Ghetto Film School, the name, I mean, I think it, it clearly is, is ironic up front. And, um, uh, but over the years, it's, you know, the reputation, the quality of the programs, and certainly what the students have gone on to, to do in their own lives, um, it, it's all part of the name. We put it in the name for a reason, to redefine the stories about us, written by people who aren't us. Hall had some pretty clear ideas about how he wanted to do things differently when it came to nonprofits and education. We never call them at risk, disadvantaged, none of the stuff that most people use uh, particularly when you're talking about young people of color. No labels for the kids. No, and this is sometimes funders have a hard thing with this because, you know, they have boxes to check off and we say, well, we don't really keep That's, that information. Yeah. Our curriculum is based on graduate level film school. Montea Robinson is the executive director of GFS. Um, you know, the work, the assignments, the classroom instruction is industry standard. The content, what they're looking to make is guided by that, and there's a real emphasis on um, critical discussion, both peer-to-peer -peer and then from student to instructor. Action. All students who work with GFS are immersed in every facet of cinematic storytelling and production. Got it. The program culminates with a short thesis project, filmed in a different foreign location every year, with real actors, and professional level equipment. For our thesis project, we travel to the Dominican Republic and we make a short film about 
essentially about the culture and inspired by the Dominican culture. Jared Ray went to Shanghai for his thesis in 2011 and now works in the film industry. That was an amazing experience, definitely one that, you know, opened my world. Being from the Bronx, being forced to write a story where I'm not from and trying to adapt to that kind of storytelling, it was definitely challenging, but it was super humbling and rewarding to be able to tell that kind of story. <laughs> Matthew Hiltzig is the GFS board member who first came up with the idea to partner with Ramaz. As much as we focus on the education of our kids, it's incomplete if we're not getting them out of their comfort zone and their bubble for them to appreciate that this country is about us. It's not just about the Jewish community. It's about all the other folks who live around us. For those of you in Ramaz or graduates, how much time had you spent in the South Bronx before this? I don't, I don't really know. I feel like no, not so much. Queens kid. Yeah. I don't think at all. I went to the Bronx Zoo a few times, but that's it. Same here. Probably went to the Bronx Zoo when I was younger, but yeah. Everybody's talked about community, and that's one thing that sort of has resonated for me. You, you're a student, but then like you, you stay involved in the program. Yeah. So many people do for, for decades, yes. Right? Yes. right? Yeah, and being able to teach these wonderful students here from Ramaz has been um, really amazing because you're able to sort of yeah, there's a level of give back, but there's also a level of um, learning from your students as well. I don't buy into this coddling culture thing of like, you know, everyone has to be sort of treated with kit gloves. And the success of Ghetto Film School has always been high expectations. Rigor, uh, not everyone's a winner, but you're here to do your thing and be your creative self. And uh, you're given the opportunity to do that um, and the resources. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's going to be your commitment of where you take that. We continue now with a program aimed to improve maternal care. It's been more than a year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, a decision that stripped away the constitutional right to abortions. The ruling led many states to implement highly restrictive abortion laws. According to a recent CBS News poll, more than half of all women say being pregnant is more dangerous from a health perspective than it was prior to the Roe v. Wade decision. Caitlin Huey Byrne shows us how some doctors in Mississippi, a state where nearly all abortions are banned, are training emergency workers to safely deliver babies. Pregnancy is like running a marathon, and then delivering the baby is like the sprint at the end. That final sprint is something Dr. Rachel Morris knows well. A Jackson-based OBGYN, Morris is no stranger to maternal emergencies, but she's concerned about worsening trends in her state. We started noticing increasing trends of maternal mortality and morbidity. How much of this is preventable? In the state of Mississippi, almost 90% of the deaths that we encountered from 2017 to 2019, so pre-COVID, were considered preventable. 90%. Almost 90%. It's not just the deaths that we are concerned about, it's the near misses that cause significant impact. So Morris launched a program called STORK at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, training emergency workers to deliver babies. So what we have designed is a pretty extensive crash course in obstetrics to teach someone how to deliver a baby, how to recover a mother, how to care for the newborn, how to identify some of the most critical problems that we identify on a daily basis. It's an urgent need. The only NICU in the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest regions of the country, closed. At least three other labor and delivery units across the state have shuttered. That's what you want to see is a nice delivery. We have rural hospitals with obstetric closures and facilities that can't support uh, labor and delivery and the staffing that it requires. So in a long, skinny state, now we're seeing you know, these maternity care deserts that exist. It's got to be so scary for these patients. Mississippi already had the highest rate of infant mortality nationwide, and the maternal death rate is worsening, particularly for black mothers. It's what a public health expert was warning about when we visited as the state prepared to ban abortion access. Is the state prepared no. for the consequences? No. 
No, it's not prepared. Republican Governor Tate Reeves signed a series of bills he says create a culture of life, including tax credits for adoption and an expansion of Medicaid coverage for up to one year postpartum. But critics say the bills aren't keeping up with the challenges, leaving other organizations to fill the need. These are the diapers that we give out for the families. The Diaper Bank of the Delta services nearly 300 families in the state and has seen an increase in donations and demand. A lot of families have signed up for more diapers. So diapers, formula, yes, anything that they need, they can come here and get it from you. Yes, ma'am. And we have some families that'll come in and say they don't have things like water, important things at home. We could get them cases of water, and we, right now we're giving out food. If they come in with any type of situation, we, we try to find a resource to help them. A helping hand for a state in need. And as for Dr. Morris, she says her program has trained over 400 people and has a six month long wait list. You're saving lives. That's why I went into medicine was to make a difference. So to hear that we've made one, saved one mother or saved one newborn or made the outcome better, yeah, there's nothing like it. Ahead, how an Olympian and former Secretary of State are championing wellness. That story is next. We close our show with an exclusive conversation with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Olympian Allison Felix. Adriana Diaz caught up with the Trailblazers to learn how they prioritize their own well-being while balancing the rigors of their jobs. Nobody ever sets out to actually be the first. I'll never forget a conversation with my good friend, the late Sally Ride, and she said, I didn't want to be the first woman in space, I just wanted to be in space. And so I think if you think too much about being the first, you won't enjoy the opportunity before you. Enjoy the ride, so to speak. Enjoy the ride, that's right, yeah. <laughs> the ride to the top wasn't always smooth for former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and track and field Olympian Allison Felix. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama, and if I had thought about barriers, I wouldn't be where I am today. My father had a very good way of saying it. Don't let somebody else's prejudice be your problem. It's difficult to be the only one in the room, um, but I think there is, there's freedom on the other side of fear. Felix once feared losing her livelihood if she didn't hide a part of her truth. I was training at 4 a.m. while it was dark so that no one would see that I was pregnant. That's because at the time in 2018, she says her sponsor Nike would reduce athletes pay if they couldn't compete, even if they were sidelined by pregnancy. She went public in a New York Times op-ed. I went through that very hard time right when I was having my daughter and just looking at her and thinking about the world that I want her to grow up in, I was absolutely terrified, but I deeply believed I was doing what was right. Nike changed its policy and Felix went on to found her own athletic shoe company, Seish. Here I am, ready to run for a brand that I founded. Which aims to support women, especially mothers. You've long spoken out about black maternal health, most recently about your friend and former teammate, Tori Bowie. I think it's been a really hard situation for everyone, and it's just highlighted that we are facing a maternal health crisis for women of color. Bowie died from complications during childbirth. An autopsy reveals she may have had seizures stemming from preeclampsia, a high blood pressure condition that disproportionately affects black women. The CDC says that black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related complication. It's 80% preventable. What can the healthcare world do? And also, what can black women do themselves? Women of color have to know that they're at risk. They have to know the signs to look for, you know, their vision being impaired, um, swollen feet, headaches, the awareness, you know, implicit bias training, you know, in the medical field. Um, in the past, black women have not been heard. They haven't, their pain hasn't been believed and that just has to stop. Health, childcare and work are all contributing to higher stress levels. In a new KPMG study, 91% of executive women report feeling an exponential growth in stress over the last three years. Is that something that you've observed or you've experienced? Stress is a part of life. And uh, particularly as you go up the ladder, it's going to be more stressful. And, and frankly, that's also 
true for men. Dr. Rice, I can't imagine the stressful situations you've been in, especially in your diplomatic life. What tools do you use to manage and navigate stress? I always found, first and foremost, acknowledging it. Uh, if you suppress it, it doesn't help. Um, I always said to myself, all right, this is a stressful situation. And by naming it, I felt that I could deal with it then. And saying, oh, I can't be stressed, come on. What you can see is, I'm feeling stress, how do I manage that stress? And I think that's the, the most important thing. Allison, for you, what are your wellness practices? Yeah, I start my day off with my gratitude journal, and that really just centers me. Um, started playing a little bit of tennis, sometimes when my days get absolutely crazy, sometimes wellness looks like sitting in my car for a little bit longer, you know, doing a little bit of meditation before I walk into the house. Both say practicing wellness has been key to their success. For Rice, that means playing piano and making time to unplug. Even when I was secretary, I would take the time between noon and seven o'clock on Sundays, and I would say, now if you have to call me, do. But if you don't, let me watch football on TV. Her love of football is more than just a hobby. She's also part owner of the Denver Broncos. My father, who's gone to heaven, is probably, thinks I finally got an important job, you know. <laughs> it's about time. Yeah. My dad, he was a football coach when I was born. And some of my happiest memories are, are watching football with my dad. So I can remember at, you know, six or seven years old, Condoleezza, what are they doing? Daddy, that's a trap block. Or uh, that's, they're setting up a screen, Daddy. Lifelong memories Felix also wants to impart to her daughter. I try to speak life into her. We do affirmations. I just want her to be really confident because I know at some point she'll have to take on her own battles and I want her to be really ready for that. What was today's affirmation? <laughs> we haven't done it yet, um, but I think it's going to be um, challenges help me grow. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.